In 1914, the three Pashas from the CUP ruled over the Ottoman Empire, but ever since their failures in the Balkan Wars, they had been carrying out a pro-Turkish policy, through deporting Greeks, massacring Assyrians and the likes. But they were in a complicated place internationally, as they couldn't agree on who to ally with. Talat Pasha was seemingly happy to align with anyone, saying, Turkey needed to join one of the country groups, so that it could organize its domestic administration, strengthen and maintain its commerce and industry, expand its railroads, in short, to survive and to preserve its existence. So there was no politics here or global goals, just the need for cash. In May 1914, Talat even met with the Russians to discuss an alliance, but they seemed to have demanded too much. Jamal Pasha, on the other hand, had long favoured an alliance with France, while Enver Pasha had been to Berlin and came to admire German militarism, and he invited German officers to train his forces. So while many claim that the Ottomans were just out looking to reclaim lost lands, or that the Germans were a natural ally, this wasn't really the case. Two out of the three Pashas looked for alliances with the Entente powers, and the Sultan, although pretty powerless now, wanted to remain neutral. Plus, many Germans were pretty reluctant to bring the Ottomans into their alliance, as they believed their inclusion would be more of a hindrance than a help. Enver, though, came up with a plan, and he offered the Germans two ships in exchange for their protection. However, the Germans were unaware that the British had already seized these ships to fight against the Germans, despite the Ottoman government paying for them. However, Jamal Pasha refused to sign this protection treaty, and the Grand Vizier Said Halim Pasha didn't want to get involved either. But then, two German warships were being chased by the Entente through the Mediterranean Sea. As they fled to Istanbul, Enver agreed to fictitiously buy the ships and bring them into Ottoman ports, free from the Entente. Sushan, the German admiral, was then made head of the Ottoman navy, and he began to restructure their forces. Internationally, they protected their western borders by signing a non-aggression pact with Bulgaria. This was once again a secret alliance, but their goals were clear to counter the Russians, Greeks and Serbians. The Ottomans, however, were still neutral, so Enver and Sushan, the German admiral, would soon drag the empire into the First World War. Enver secured a huge loan from the Germans, hoping to get support in the cabinet, and then, without authorization, closed off the straits, cutting off Russia from her allies. Sushan then used Ottoman ships to bombard Russian cities like Odessa, Sevastopol and Yalta. The Ottoman government was largely horrified by this action and drafted a letter of apology to the Russian Empire. Enver, though, added in a bit which accused the Russians of instigating the attack, making sure that this apology would not be accepted. The Russians then retaliated and struck Turkish ports, while Winston Churchill, without any real authorization himself, sent his fleet to attack Ottoman ships. So, largely, Enver Pasha and Sushan had brought the Turks into the First World War. But first I'd like to thank Tacticus for sponsoring this video. This is a brand new tactical strategy game set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, where players can battle in the grim darkness of the far future. Tacticus introduces challenging and detailed hex battlefields, and in the game you can collect, upgrade, assemble and lead over 50 champions of the Imperium, Chaos and Xenos in quick battles on the go. With a continuously expanding collection of upgradable champions, Tacticus challenges players to utilize unique team synergies and master the hex terrain to outwit their opponents and dominate the tactical battlefield. Fight anytime and anywhere in fast-paced PvE campaigns, tightly competitive PvP battles, and also in massively collaborative boss fights under your guild banner. You can recruit champions from 13 playable factions, like the Adeptus Mechanicus, who are the tech priests of Mars and guardians of the Imperium's technological secrets. They blend the zeal of religion with a mastery of machines, pursuing knowledge and power with relentless fervor, forever seeking to venerate the divine trinity of the machine god, the Omnissiah, and the motive force. By joining these factions, you will become part of Warhammer's dedicated community, and the devs have kept this community in mind, as they have constantly listened to the passionate fans. So you too can conquer the tactical battlefields of the far future by downloading Tacticus from the App Store, Google Play or Samsung. And I'll see you out there on the battlefield. But for now, let's get back to the video. They were barely powerful enough to cope with such a war. The Ottomans produced very little steel, they only had a couple of factories to produce weapons, their economy was still mainly agricultural, and they had very few train lines. Their forces were also poorly organised, 
and while they could maybe mobilise one million men, they were still lacking a lot of equipment. But the Germans had grand plans for the Islamic world, and pressured the Sultan into proclaiming a jihad against the Entente powers. Although this had some degree of support far away, closer to home, the Turks didn't really have the support of many of their own Muslim subjects. Plus, the Europeans still controlled North Africa. However, the situation here was a little more complicated. Starting in Egypt, where Abbas II was Khedive ever since 1892. He, however, often met with Egyptian nationalists and funded their newspapers. So for a long time, Kitchener wanted to have him deposed. When war broke out, Abbas was actually in Istanbul, and he aroused suspicions when he didn't immediately leave. So the British declared that the country was now under their full protection, with Hussein Pasha, their puppet ruler. Abbas, meanwhile, would continue to claim the throne for years in his exile. Churchill then quickly tried to knock the Ottomans out of the war by sailing to Istanbul. But the Turkish coastal defences stopped the ships from progressing through the Dardanelles in early 1915. The British and her allies then landed, hoping to overrun these bases, but they were contained, and this, the Gallipoli campaign, would end in disaster after a year. Meanwhile, the Turks were also trying to claim a quick victory in Egypt. They mustered together an army of about 20,000 men under German command, and they pushed on to try to capture the Suez Canal. Yet, although they took over most of the Sinai Peninsula, they could go no further. There would be other attempts to claim the canal, like in 1916, when Austrian and German troops joined the Turks, but they were defeated at the Battle of Romani. There were, however, further threats to the Entente powers across North Africa, though. Like in French Morocco, a pretender to the throne known as the Blue Sultan had been defeated in 1912, but he continued resisting in the Atlas Mountains. And then the Zayan Confederation had been preventing the French from pushing through into the Taza Corridor. The French governor of Morocco, Lyoté, had very few men to deal with them. As the French government said, the fate of Morocco will be determined in Lorraine. His remaining army included German prisoners of war, old reservists, and members of the Battalion of the Light Infantry of Africa, which were mainly made up of criminals. These men held off numerous attacks on Canifera, but their counterattacks in late 1914 failed and a general stalemate ensued. The Germans and Ottomans then got involved, as they identified Morocco as France's Achilles heel in Africa. Luckily for them, there were two deposed sultans, Abdel Hafid and Abdel Aziz. And out of these two, Abdel Hafid was more open to the idea of an alliance and met with the Germans in neutral Spain. He, however, seemed more interested in getting money from both sides and in the end, refused to be transported to Morocco. So the Germans turned to the Zayan leaders. They were able to do this because many of the French legionnaires were actually German and they deserted to join the tribes. They helped bring aid to the rebels while the French again tried to demonstrate their power this time through the Casablanca Fair of 1915. But very little land really changed hands from here on out. There would be other conflicts in North Africa, like with the Senussis in Italian Libya. For instance, in 1915, at the Battle of Gasser Buhadi, the Italians tried to attack a Senussi camp. But there they were ambushed and driven back to the outskirts of Tripoli, leaving the Italians once again stuck to their coastal cities. Later on, the Senussis would also collaborate with the Turks against the Entente as well. But there would be far more action over in Mesopotamia. Nearby, the British had already been extracting oil, and they relied on pipes running through Iraq out into the Persian Gulf. So the British in India quickly sent troops to Fao and received support from Mubarak in Kuwait, who joined in their assault on Basra. This battle was barely comparable to the rest of the war though, as 500 British troops easily attacked the city and took it from a garrison of around 1,500 men. The British then drove back counterattacks and began looking to expand further. Inside Iraq, most of the population were being pulled by the different sides. Like Suleiman Askeri, the Circassian founder of the paramilitary group known as the Special Organization, was trying to promote the Ottoman cause. However, he would later kill himself in 1915 after further defeats. Otherwise, the Shia of Iraq were a potential ally for both sides. They had long received money from the British and disliked the Ottoman centralization efforts. But German officers, alongside armoured Khan Qajar, arrived in the holy city of Karbala to declare jihad on the Western powers. The religious leaders of the city also promised to address the Shah of Persia, 
trying to encourage him to join in the war. However, this came to nothing. But the Germans did have hope in Persia, as the Ayatollah al Yazdi had been trying to encourage uprisings against the Europeans ever since the Italians took over Libya. And now, after hearing the call to jihad, he called on the people to defend Islamic territories. So the Shia tribes who had long fought against the Turks joined to fight alongside them and they put together a Mujahideen force. Many in this force however were just in it for the loot, others often lied about the numbers of men they had to receive more aid, and the distribution of funds often caused fights to break out and men returned home by 1915. The Turks also continued to make more enemies, like one Turkish commander named Ormad Bey Orak called the Iraqi tribesmen traitors. Sheikh al-Rumid of the Bani Malik responded saying, you are the traitors of Islam, and your discrimination against the Arabs is crystal clear. The British though, after securing Basra, largely ignored Mesopotamia as they were more focused on Gallipoli. Some prominent people like Gertrude Bell had worked for the Arab Bureau alongside the tribes, but their actions were often challenged by the government in India, which wanted control over the region and were worried about encouraging separatist rebellions. So prominent separatists like al Nakib, who tried to become the ruler of Basra before the war, were deported to India. Other potential allies early on included al Misri, a former Ottoman officer and founder of the al Had secret society, which called for the independence of Iraq. From his exile in Cairo, he hoped to secure British weapons to start a rebellion, but again, nothing came of it. Then there was Muhammad Sharif al Faruqi, who defected to the British after being captured by them in Gallipoli. But I'll get onto him later though, as he may have been one of the most influential characters in Middle Eastern history, despite being a fraud. After the Gallipoli campaign failed though, the British began to look at finally creating alliances with the Arabs. Their troops also moved north, as in July 1915, they reached Nasiriya, the central base of the Al Muntafiq. The other cities of Iraq were quickly filling with Ottoman deserters, and the number of deserters was pretty staggering. As General Lehman von Sander said, today the number of Turkish deserters is higher than the numbers of soldiers actually in the army. These deserters and returning Mujahideen then rose up in Karbala against Ottoman rule. Although they weren't necessarily in favour of the British, they hampered the Ottoman war efforts and provided sanctuary to thousands of other deserters. As the British advanced, Ayatollah al Yazdi began to step away from calls of jihad. And the Ottomans realised that their Mujahideen force was more of a hindrance, so they stopped arming the tribes. Out in the countryside, Edmund Candler wrote, Anarchy is normal. There is no village that is not a battlefield. Every sheikh is against his neighbour, brother against brother, and there is no loyalty within the community. So, in Iraq, there was no strong ally for either side. Like, the British were able to create a Muntafiq division out of a few dozen men from around Nasiriyah. And there were the odd local allies, like Sheikh Ibrahim of al Zubiyah next to Basra. Or, even in northern Arabia, the Ottomans had an ally in Jabal Shamar. But within this tribe, there was a branch known as Aslam, and in this branch, Dawi ibn Tawala would later join the British. In the east, there was Persia, but within Persia, there was the province of Arabistan or Khuzestan, which was pretty independent. There, Sheikh Khazal ibn Jabir was making a great deal of money from British oil, and he remained loyal to them throughout the war. In fact, Percy Cox even offered him the throne of Kuwait in return for his loyalty. But he was a close friend of Mubarak, the leader of Kuwait, and refused. Also, because he stayed out of the war, he therefore rejected the call to jihad. So many people called him a traitor, and they rebelled in February 1915. Over in Kuwait, Shia clerics continued to try to push Mubarak to join in with the jihad. He actually criticised the most prominent leaders, like Muhammad al-Shankiti and Tafiz Waba. He said that his dealings with Britain were beneficial, despite the fact I don't like the British, and acknowledge that their religion is very different from mine. He then called on Kuwaitis to help his friend in Arabistan and crush the rebels. But many of his soldiers refused to take part, saying, we cannot obey that which angers Allah, and they joined in the fight against the British. The British though continued to advance on to Kut, forcing the Ottomans to finally realise their mistake in ignoring Mesopotamia. They sent a German, Kolmer von der Goltz, to stop further British advances onto Baghdad. 
and they even drove the British out of Kut in late 1915. This siege was one of the most disastrous events for Britain during the war. As historian Jan Morris described it, the most abject capitulation in Britain's military history. This is because the relief force was so poorly organised that they were killed arriving at the Turkish lines in their thousands. Then 10,000 prisoners were taken when the city surrendered and most of these died on their marches through the deserts or within the camps. In prison though some of the Indian Muslims would join the German cause eventually. This defeat did stop the British for a while, yet the Ottomans continued to direct much of their attention to the Caucasus. Here they faced the real risk of Russian expansion. After all, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Sazanov announced very early on that they wanted Istanbul and most of the surrounding lands. He even specified that he intended to repopulate this land with loyal Cossacks. Plus, the Ottomans also wanted to expand into the Caucasus and beyond, uniting with the Turks of Central Asia. But the Russians were still occupying Tabriz and Persia, and at the Battle of Sarikamish in late 1914, the Ottomans were devastated in the Caucasus campaign, losing up to 60,000 men. Unable to accept responsibility for such a defeat, the CUP, especially Enver Pasha, began to publicly blame the Armenians for supporting the Russians. Many of the retreating Turkish soldiers then began to massacre the Armenians. The governor of Van, Jevdep Bey, ordered that all of the Armenians hand over their arms, and Jamal Pasha proposed deporting them far from the front line. On the other side of the border, Tsar Nicholas, alongside the head of the Armenian church, said, Armenians from all countries are hurrying to enter the ranks of the glorious Russian army, and with their blood to serve the victory of the Russian army. Let the Russian flag wave freely over the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus. Let your will the peoples remaining under the Turkish yoke receive freedom. The Tsar also promised to give them autonomy, however, they shouldn't be seen as just defending the Armenians. As in 1896, Count Lobanov Ratovsky said, We need Armenia, but without the Armenians, hearkening back to the rhetoric of the Circassian genocide. So both the Russians and the Turks were calling on the Armenians to incite rebellions across the border, leaving them stuck in the middle. And Turkish paranoia grew when reports indicated that Armenians were moving weapons around and preparing to help the Russians. And if they did this, the Persian campaign would be jeopardised. So we first need to look at this the Persian campaign. This began when Enver Pasha moved into Persia despite their neutrality, in order to attack the Russians in Tabriz. From here, in his own words to his soldiers, your duty is to move with your division towards Persia and proceed through Tabriz to Dagestan, where you will ignite a general rebellion and repulse the Russians from the shores of the Caspian Sea. So this would be the first move in the creation of a pan-Turkic state. The Turkish troops would be supported by Germans like Wilhelm Vasmus, who would be called the German Lawrence. He would move around Persia trying to start rebellions against the British and the Russians in the country. So keep his name in mind for later on, as he will gain the support of many tribes in Persia. Meanwhile, the actual Persian army was still languishing behind the rest of the world. They still relied on tribesmen to defend different provinces, but many of these tribesmen would just join foreign powers. And their most professional army was the Persian Cossacks, however, they were under the command of Russians. So the Ottomans moved in quite freely in early 1915, and there they found that most of the Russians in Tabriz had already left to defend their own borders. However, when the city fell, the Russians quickly countered, and in a couple of months, drove the Ottomans back out of Persia. Back in Armenian lands though, the massacres continued. Like Jevdet Bey, earned the nickname Lord Blacksmith, for nailing horseshoes to people's feet. Therefore, when he demanded that Armenians and Assyrians send conscripts into his army, the people of Van refused, and they prepared for war. As Jevdet's forces marched on the city, Talat Bey issued his order on the 24th of April, to arrest all Armenian political leaders and intellectuals. From Istanbul to the Caucasus, they were rounded up and deported or killed. However, they would go even further. As Talat Pasha reported to the Germans, one who was still innocent today could be guilty tomorrow. Our actions were determined by national and historical necessity. 
I should say there will at this point be many atrocities committed against the Greeks in Anatolia at this time, but I'll describe them in more details later on. Jevdet meanwhile laid siege to Van and began allowing refugees from the countryside to enter the city, tens of thousands of them, putting a strain on the resources. The besieged Armenians under Aram Manokian formed a pretty effective local government, and they began manufacturing bullets and sent messages to Russia asking for assistance. The Russians, supported by volunteer Armenian brigades, relieved the city in mid-May. They then tried to continue their advance, but Ottoman reinforcements arrived and stopped them at the Battle of Manzikert that July. The Russians withdrew to their original lines and, initially, refused to allow the Armenians to join them. Thousands of people were left behind, and many of those who did flee regardless were killed en route. But still the Armenians in Van held out. Out in the countryside, Jevdet continued to sack Christian villages, while another Turkish army advanced on the city. Jamal Pasha and Talat Pasha then ordered that all Armenians be deported from their homes, even those living in Adrianople, west of Istanbul. In their place, the Directorate for the Settlement of Tribes and Immigrants began to work on filling up the vacant lands and homes with Muslims, creating a new loyal population in their eastern provinces. As for the Armenians, they were marched out in deportation convoys, where they were attacked by bandits, local militias, tribesmen, and soldiers in the Third Army. The perpetrators came from many different backgrounds, like Turks, Chechen, Chakassians, and Kurds. Some were just after loot, others were encouraged by imams who began preaching violence against Christians. The Turkish officials that refused to take part, like Mehmed Chalal Bey, were stripped of their positions, and anyone found harboring Armenians would also be persecuted. So the Armenians were going on death marches. Able-bodied men were often separated from the rest of the groups. On their way, they would arrive at transit camps, where many would be killed. Some were shot and dumped into rivers. There are reports of many being tied together and thrown into the rivers. But there were now so many bodies that sections began to block up, and explosives were needed to clear it. Many did fight back. Like in Urfa, the people rose up, rather than willingly march out into the desert. And some were able to survive by converting to Islam. These were called the Vorpa Havak, and there were maybe around 200,000 of them. However, many people in this situation were often brought into households as slaves almost, where they would be assaulted or forced to do work by Turkish, Arab or Kurdish families that brought them in. Elsewhere, some prominent Turkish nationalists like Halida Adib played a role in schooling orphans. However, in these schools, the children were Turkified. As one American Red Cross worker reported, not a word of Armenian or Kurdish was allowed. The teachers and overseers were carefully trained to impress Turkish ideas and customs upon the lives of the children and to catchize them regularly on the prestige of the Turkish race. Some that did make it as far away as Damascus were sold openly in markets and were transported as far away as Arabia or Tunisia. So their final destination should have been the Levant, but there nearly one million of them were forced into camps in Ras Alayin and Deir Azor. Here again, they would be subjected to assaults, many would be sold as slaves again, and some were even forced to work in the war effort. But by 1916, still half a million survived. So another wave of massacres would be ordered by Talat Pasha, which killed 200,000 that year. In total, maybe a million or so were killed in death marches, the camps, massacres and the likes. However, whether or not this is a genocide has been disputed. Ergodan, for instance, the leader of Turkey today, argued that no Muslim could perpetrate a genocide. Others often claim that this was merely a horror or disaster committed in times of war. Like after the war, Ataturk said, whatever has befallen the non-Muslim elements living in our country is the result of the policies of separatism they pursued in a savage manner. In fact, calling it a genocide in Turkey is a punishable offence as it insults Turkishness. Turkish historian Tana Akçam explains this denial saying, it's not easy for a nation to call its founding fathers murderers and thieves. So they even have pages on their embassy websites dedicated to proving that it was not a genocide. For instance, fact two, Armenian losses were few in comparison to the over 2.5 million Muslim dead from the same period. This is in fact true, as many Muslims were killed after the Balkan Wars and during the First World War. 
But then again, German losses were greater than Jewish losses in World War II, so genocides can hardly ever be attributed to just the number of dead. Or fact three, certain oft-cited Armenian evidence is of diminished value, having been derived from dubious and prejudicial sources. But many of their allies also reported atrocities. Like German ambassador Wolf Metternich said, in its attempt to carry out its purpose to resolve the Armenian question by the destruction of the Armenian race, the Turkish government has refused to be deterred neither by our representations nor by those of the American embassy. Or there was the Venezuelan mercenary Rafael de Nogales, who reported that the governor, Mehmed Resid, received orders from the central government to burn, destroy, kill. Or Armin Wegner, a German soldier, who said, like a wild beast the Turkish soldiers, officers and gendarmes swept down on this welcome prey. All the crimes that had ever been committed against women were committed here. They cut off their breasts, mutilated their limbs and their corpses lay naked, defiled and blackened by the heat on the fields. Like one Turkish officer who served under a particularly brutal commander, Halil Kut, testified about what happened. Halil had the entire Armenian population massacred without pity. My company received a similar order. Many of the victims were buried alive in especially prepared ditches. So many countries are beginning to accept that it was a genocide, however, it's still debated. Nobody argues that crimes were not committed, but whether or not the Turks were trying to truly exterminate the Armenian population. While all of this was going on, the Assyrians continued to be killed. At the beginning of the war, the Russians quickly captured Bashgali, however, when they were driven back, the Assyrians in that area were massacred. So, obviously, many Assyrians refused Ottoman calls for neutrality, and, around Hikari, their militia started a rebellion. This began in May 1915, and the Russians did promise help, but nothing really came of it. So, Talat Pasha gave the order, we should not let them return to their homelands. And, the Ottomans began to encircle their highlands. Many managed to escape across the border into Persia and organize themselves into a fighting force to help the Russian army. The Russians then promised Aga Petros that they would be given an independent state once the war was over. The Ottomans though then began to launch attacks into Persia, killing up to 20,000 Christians that had settled there. In some cases, the Assyrians sought refuge in monasteries or even in the homes of Persian governors. But the Ottomans found allies, like Simpo Shakak, a local Kurdish leader. He helped the Ottomans attack the governor's family, the monastery, and towns like Haftavan, where the population was wiped out. Some Kurds, though, did try to save the Christian Assyrians, like the Bishop Adashur, who was brought under the protection of Osman, the Agar of Tanza. And many Kurds would rise up against the Ottomans. Like in Dersim, the Feratasagi tribe killed a relative of the mayor and then rebelled. This was quickly subdued, but in early 1915, more Kurds rebelled in Bhutan and drove out the Ottoman governors. And these rebellions would only intensify, as many feared that the Turks would begin wiping out their populations as well. As for the Agra of Tanza, who protected many Christians, Kurds who had aligned with the Ottomans dragged him out of hiding and cut off his head in public. Then, once again, many were killed or enslaved. In total, in some regions, like Deir Bakir, over 90% of Armenians and Assyrian Catholics were either killed or deported. The Ottoman governor, Wehub Pasha, said, The massacre and annihilation of the Armenians and the looting and plunder of their properties were the result of the decision of the Central Committee. The Ottomans tried to bury any evidence of these crimes. In fact, Wahib said, this is the reason that many of the orders were passed on orally. But news still left the country, and the Western powers accused the Turks of crimes against humanity as part of the May 1915 Triple Entente Declaration. There, they promised to bring all of the guilty to justice. While within the Ottoman Empire, these massacres or genocide, along with the pan-Turkish ideology, almost created alliances between different religions in some cases. For instance, many Kurds would back the Armenians, and so too would many Arabs. To understand the Arab anger though, we need to look at Jamal Pasha, who was ruling over in Syria. His role in the genocide has been questioned though, as some say he gave aid to the Armenians, but he also recruited many into forced labor battalions. Interestingly though, on Jamal, he was from the very beginning distrustful of Germany. 
so much so that he was seemingly ready to negotiate with the Entente. Like historian Wolfgang Gust says, he was prepared to march to Constantinople with an army in order to dismiss the CUP and take power for himself, provided the Entente guaranteed the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. And furthermore, provided it was prepared to make him the Sultan with the right of succession for his descendants. In return, he would protect the Armenians and end the genocide. Negotiations broke down though because allegedly the French and the British feared Russian expansion. Jamal though was a pretty ruthless leader in the Levant. He however directed much of his anger and repression against the Arabs and the Jews. Like in 1917, 8,000 Jews were deported from Jaffa and their houses were looted. Many were also found in the deserts, having been massacred or died of exhaustion. And as for the Arabs, many intellectuals and political leaders were again arrested or killed. Like Salim Ali Salam, a leader in Beirut said, Jamal Pasha resumed his campaign of vengeance. His real intent was to cut off thoughtful heads, so that, as he put it, the Arabs would never again emerge as a force. Salim would then go on to witness many Arabs being hanged on Jamal's orders. So many Arab Muslims did defend Christian Armenians, even going back to 1909 when Sheikh Salim al-Bisri forbid any Muslim from engaging in massacres. Or in 1917, the Sharif of Mecca said, what is demanded of you is to protect all members of the Armenian community. This would be particularly important as the Sharif of Mecca and his sons were already incredibly wary of the young Turks. One of his sons named Abdullah had already come to Egypt before the war to meet with Kitchener. There he discussed the possibility of British support for a rebellion, worried that the Hejaz railway line would bring Turkish influence south. Then as tensions rose in the Levant, the Arab societies like Al Fatat approached another son of the Sharif named Faisal. They hoped that he would lead a rebellion and unite Arab lands south of the 37th parallel. This was all part of the Damascus Protocol of May 1915. Plus, the Sharif and his family were growing more worried of Ottoman rule as they discovered a plot to replace them. Yet still, Faisal in particular believed he needed the support of a great power. Kitchener, back in 1914, had already promised to guarantee the independence, rights and privileges of the Sharifate against all external foreign aggression, in particular that of the Ottomans. Then, when Faisal returned to Mecca, they began to correspond with Sir Henry McMahon. Hussein, the Sharif of Mecca, first asked for recognition of his claims below the 37th parallel. But McMahon responded, the two districts of Messina and Alexandretta and portions of Syria cannot be said to be purely Arab. Yet he offered his support elsewhere if it isn't a detriment to the interests of her ally France. Hussein then gave up on claiming Mersin and Adana. And as for Iraq, he said, we might agree to leave under British troops against a suitable sum paid as compensation to the Arab Kingdom for the period of occupation. But McMahon still refused to agree to Beirut and Aleppo as they were being claimed by France. Nevertheless, the date of the revolt was chosen to be June 1916. McMahon, however, sent a private letter during this time saying, I do not take the idea of a future strong united independent Arab state too seriously. The conditions of Arabia do not and will not for a very long time to come lend themselves to such a thing. But in these letters it was pretty clear, Britain could get Iraq in return for compensation and France had an eye on Syria, while the rest of Arabia was up for grabs. And many Arabs continued to fear further oppression at the hands of the CUP. Plus throughout it all, the Persian campaign expanded. Like in August 1915, the British once again seized the island of Boucher to demonstrate their power in the region. While within the country, there was a new independent military unit, the Gendarmerie. This was actually proposed by an American and put under the command of a Swede called Harald Hjalmarsson. So now the Russians controlled the Cossacks and a Swede controlled the Gendarmerie. Well, within the Gendarmerie, many of the officers were sympathetic to the Central Powers, or at least they were opposed to the Russians and British. They just began to act independently, like Colonel Pessian began attacking pro-Russian Cossack brigades in Hamadan in November 1915. 
But the situation was truly far more complicated than just this. The country was still predominantly tribal, and each tribe backed a different major power. As Arnold Wilson wrote, Life for the tribesmen was hard and getting harder. Their leader robbed them, and were in turn fleeced by rapacious governors. The tribesmen robbed each other, or villagers, travellers, or merchants. No one cared to build, or even to sow more than he need, lest he be deprived of the fruits of his labour. The country was also still divided into spheres of influence, and some tribes began to join the Russians and the British. Like the Kamsa tribal confederation in Laristan joined the British, and many would eventually be organised into the South Persian Rifles in 1916. The Bakhtiari, on the other hand, had a far more complicated history with the British. The Bakhtiari Oil Company, which struck oil in 1909, provided them with an annual income. But the leaders could never really control their tribesmen. One of the leaders who actually made a deal with the British was Ali Kali Khan, one of the leaders of the Constitutional Revolution. Yet his sister, Bibi Mayam, was vehemently opposed to the British and Russians, and led troops during the war. As for the Germans, on the other hand, they could bank on the support of the Kashkai. They had been in communication with Vasmus, the German Lawrence, and fought many small battles against the British and their allies in the south. Many other tribesmen joined Vasmus on the promise of money and aid, but this would never materialise. Nevertheless, these German allies did block the road to Shiraz and captured British consuls. In Boucher, Vasmus found an ally in Rais Ali Dalvari. He led his Tangastani tribes in attacking the British, but they were fought back. Other German agents were also working elsewhere. Like Max Otto Schunemann in Kermansar, Otto Erdmann stirred up rebellions in Hamadan, and others worked in Isfahan Yads in Kerman. All of these essentially turned towns against the Entente. Others like Count Kanitz worked in Tehran, while Wippert von Blutcher worked in the west, trying to stir up rebellions among the Kurdish Kalor tribe. While in the north, almost independently, Mirza Kutchuk Khan launched the jungle movement. He had been another leader in the constitutional revolution, and was opposed to government corruption and foreign influence. But people disagree on whether this was a separatist movement, or maybe later, even a communist one. In short though, the Germans were turning towns and tribes into bases of support for them. The Russians still had the Cossack Brigade under their control, and the backing of the Armenians and Assyrians in the north. The British occupied the south and had allies there, the gendarmerie under Colonel Pessian was attacking the Persian Cossack Brigade, and other autonomous groups fought for all sorts of things. In the middle of it all, in Tehran, there was a constant shift in Prime Ministers. By 1915 though, Mostofi al mamalek was now Prime Minister, having served numerous times before. He was desperately trying to maintain Persia's neutrality, by remaining close to the British, and diplomatically trying to get the Russians to leave. But the Russians feared a further spread of rebellions, and decided to act. In late 1915, their army of the Caucasus marched south. The German prince Heinrich Royce tried to rally together an army of tribesmen, Kurds and gendarmerie, but it failed. They fled the capital and set up a new provincial government, while the Shah stayed put, and Abdul Hussein Mirza Farman Farmer became the new prime minister. He remained far more pro-British than his predecessor, often just in exchange for loans. In the place of the now disbanded gendarmerie, Percy Sykes created the South Persian Rifles. This should have only been a police force, but it truly acted more like an army. The Russians then continued on their advance south. In early 1916 they took Hamadan, then Kermanshah, and they were planning on striking at Baghdad, but they stopped. This however finally drove a wedge in between the Ottomans and the Persians, and they were able to defeat the remaining gendarmerie late in the year. The Germans, however, had long been eyeing up the possibility of bringing Persia into the war from the very beginning. They had, after all, pressured the Sultan into declaring a jihad, and had huge ambitions across the world. But to try and unravel all of this, we need to look at Max von Oppenheim. He was an archaeologist who spent many years in the Middle East, and he became head of the new Intelligence Bureau of the East. He was fortunate, as many Muslims had come to believe that the Kaiser had secretly converted after his trip to Jerusalem. So many actually called him Haji Wilhelm. Oppenheimer's organisation was actually already busy at work, trying to form alliances with Muslims around the world from the very beginning of the war. In fact, there's actually reports that he met with Faisal, the son of the Sharif of Mecca, 
and try to convert him over to the German side early in 1915. And it's even alleged that he gave speeches encouraging the massacre of Armenians. The Bureau, however, went much further and looked at starting rebellions across the colonized world. Although the British would call this the Hindu-German conspiracy, much of it was aimed at Muslims. There were Hindus involved though, like the Ghadar party, who in exile began to plot against the British by sending weapons to rebels in India. But the Ghadar party had far more followers in immigrant communities in North America, Malaysia and the likes. So von Papen planned on buying weapons in America and shipping them undercover over to Asia. To do this, he used Irish nationalists who would go via Mexico, which was then in a civil war. Then they'd be shipped over to the Dutch East Indies and on to Burma. However, the ship was discovered and the Annie Larsen affair became international news. The Germans would have far more schemes, like the Siam Burma plan. This would see weapons brought into Siam, then sent to Burma, and there the people would rise up in December 1915. But again, information was leaked and nothing came of it. But going back to the aspects of this Hindu conspiracy that involved Muslims. Like in early 1915 in Singapore, the soldiers planned to mutiny. This mutiny was stopped and many were killed. But although the British tried to downplay the connection, it seems that many of the mutineers were Muslims and many of those were drummed up into supporting the call for jihad. There was also the Berlin Committee. This group of Indian nationalists had members inside of Syria, Egypt and Baghdad, all hoping to infiltrate the Indian forces fighting for the British. Then they planned on assassinating British officers and forcing the British out of Asia. In fact, the British Mesopotamian campaign was partly just to demonstrate British strength in the region, as if they had been absent from the Middle East and Asia, there would be a strong likelihood that India and the likes would have fallen. The Berlin Committee also began to recruit prisoners of war to form an Indian legion. One of the leaders was a Muslim named Ambra Prasad, and he tried to recruit people from across the Middle East. He actually took some troops across Persia and captured the border town of Karman. They then began to harass the British, prompting some Muslim leaders to declare their independence. Like the Baluchi chief of Bampur and tribes like the Mari and Ketran, who also began to launch raids. But when the Russians and later the British expanded their control in Persia and Iraq, their supply lines were cut and they retreated to Shiraz. Plus, many of these groups had connections to Germany prior to the war, like Sadar Ajit Singh, who was trying to whip up Islamic support against Britain in 1909 from his exile in Persia. However, many of their plans to topple British India relied on uniting the Turks, Persians and Afghans and then invading the country. And to this end, the Germans dispatched the Niedermeyer Hentik expedition to Afghanistan. This, however, also overlapped with yet another movement, known as the Silk Letter Movement. This began when Mahmoud Hassan Diobandi travelled to Hejaz to meet the Turkish governor of the province, Ghalib Pasha. He wanted to make sure that any Diobandi insurrection against the British would receive Turkish and German support. He then received guarantees on three silk letters. Meanwhile, one Diobandi leader did make it to Kabul. Their plan was to create an Islamic army in the holy cities and then an Indian army in Kabul. And together, they would liberate India. But news once again leaked and many members of the Silk Letter movement were arrested. Mahmud himself would be arrested by the Sharif of Mecca when he joined the British camp. In Turkey, Enver Pasha was particularly keen on all of these plans. So he wanted to help out the Niedermeyer Hentik expedition and sent troops to guard them through the Middle East. The expedition leaders also found an ally to serve as a figurehead, known as Mahendra Patrap. He was an Indian nobleman and member of the Berlin Committee. He would be joined by German officers and a collection of Islamic scholars, Afghans, Turkish officers and Indian nationalists, many of which were Hindu and some were Muslim. They proceeded through Turkey to Persia, being aided by many of their allies. But the British were made aware of their actions and created the Sistan force to try and stop them from entering Afghanistan. This however was unsuccessful and by October they arrived in Kabul to meet Habibullah Khan. He was provided with many gifts, the Sultan's declaration of jihad on paper and many promises. The Kaiser even promised that if he was to join their cause, he would receive Russian and British lands, stretching from Barbay to Samarkand. But the Emir was still more pro-British than they anticipated. There were others in his court 
who were more open to the idea of an alliance, like Nasrullah Khan, his brother, who was far more religious. And even the Emir's youngest son, Amanullah, was also a potential ally. The Emir, though, didn't believe the German promises. After all, he depended on British money and was trapped between rival nations. So, in the city, the expedition leaders tried to win over the princes and the people, offering money, building hospitals, and Kalim Pasha spoke to the Turkic tribesmen about pan-Turkish plans. The Indian members even created their own provincial government late in the year. Eventually, the Emir did agree to a treaty of friendship, and said if 20,000 troops arrived, he would invade India. Many in his court then called for a declaration of jihad, but nothing happened. And as he grew suspicious of his own pro-German family members, he began to add on further conditions, like he required the Indians to rise up first as well. So the expedition leaders left, once again evading the British. Mahendra Patrap was now left alone in Kabul, wanting to invade India. He would eventually even turn to Bolshevik Russia for an alliance, but nothing ever came of this. The British then decided to change tactics in Afghanistan, assuring the Emir of his neutrality and displaying their planes and military hardware to tribal chiefs to demonstrate their power. But the Germans still didn't stop. They had other plans like the Half Moon Camp. Here they recruited 4,000 or so prisoners of war and trained them to fight in the Jihad against the Entente powers. However, von Oppenheim could never really build a real army, and even its propaganda benefits were limited. The Entente, on the other hand, still had huge numbers of Muslim volunteers in their armies, like 47,000 Tunisians, 140,000 Algerians, and 25,000 Moroccans fought for the French. As for Britain, 400,000 Indian Muslims joined their ranks. So the Germans began to look for other ways to encourage uprisings, and in other places. Like in Italian Libya, which I'll get onto later, but also far away in Oman. Here, Sultan Taimur ruled over a divided country, propped up by the British. But his rule only extended along the coast, and the British had forced him to end the slave trade and clamp down on gunrunners. These runners had long made money bringing weapons from Oman's colony around Guadur, which they owned for decades. So many were now deprived of this income, and those in the interior believed that this was a challenge to their power and autonomy. They therefore elected their own imam once again. This time it was Salim bin Rashid al karusi and he led attacks on the British garrison in Muscat in 1914 and early 1915. The British tried to persuade the Sultan to make concessions in order to make peace, like some sort of implementation of Sharia law. But this was rejected, and many Indian defenders continued to fight off the rebels. Then, in 1915, German agents began to arrive in Oman, and the idea spread that the German Kaiser was Muslim. The rebels, convinced that the Kaiser would win the war, refused to surrender, and the situation remained a stalemate until long after the war had ended. And finally, nearby in Yemen, the situation continued to be complicated. For simplicity's sake, prior to the war, the British signed many treaties with the tiny states in the region, but they were still pretty independent. The British position in Aden could have also been challenged. The Indian Brigade therefore took Perim Island early on. And the British here had some help, as prior to the war, Sayyid Muhammad ibn Ali al Idrisi had been proclaimed Imam of Asir. In 1915, he established contacts with the British to be recognized as an independent leader. Just a year later, though, there would be a breakaway state known as Upper Asia. This was led by Al Hassan bin Ayyad. However, there's little information on why this state broke away or their governance. In the middle of them was Yahya Muhammad Hamid ad Din of Yemen. He was also recognized as an independent ruler and largely stayed out of the war. However, he did allow Ottoman troops to pass south along the coast. As for the host of small nations, really marking them as under British protection is too simple. As some states like Baida had been trying to get their protection prior to the war, but failing. Now though, the Sultan, Ali bin Abdallah, was in a much better position to demand rifles for his support. There was also the Haushaubi, who had signed a treaty of friendship with the British in 1914. They sent troops to help Baida, and together they chased the Turks away for a while. But on the other side, the Turks did have allies among the Shia Zaidi people. They won out and crossed into Lahej in the middle of 1915, which had long been a British ally. 
General Shaw, commanding British troops in Aden, sent help to Lahej, and they prepared for a siege. However, many Arabs deserted the British, and the city lacked water. Meanwhile, many Arab tribesmen in the south had joined the Turks. Like the al hadera Mansur tribe, had broken away from the Fadli Sultanate. They seemed to have supported the Ottomans as a way of getting revenge on the Fadli, rather than because they were fighting for a greater cause. The Ottomans then proceeded on to Aden, but the colony was saved with the arrival of Indian reinforcements, and the Turkish position would be jeopardized by the Arab Revolt. <laughs> 